<laughs> okay, we did it. We did Hi. it. Thanks Glad for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. Well, this is quite a day, uh, marking four years in Charlottesville uh, because Integrity First for America, and we should probably introduce ourselves, uh, but Integrity First for America, which you represent, um, and Jewish Democratic Council of America, uh, which I represent. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is quite the anniversary for, for us both. Uh, for JDCA, uh, this really was the beginning of our organization. Uh, the founders of JDCA uh, were preparing to launch in advance of the 2018 midterms, but in the immediate aftermath of Charlottesville, it was clear that there was a need, an acute need in our country for an organization like JDCA. And because of Charlottesville, they launched uh, immediately after, four years ago this month. But this anniversary is also very meaningful for Integrity First for America, Amy. So we wanted to hear from you on this day uh, about what it means for IFA. And uh, we'll start the conversation there. So over to yeah, you, absolutely. Amy. Absolutely. It uh, is very much a both sobering day, but I think for me and for our team and the plaintiffs in our lawsuit, which I'm sure we'll talk about, it's also, it also feels like we're on the cusp of accountability because we're finally going to trial where we'll hold accountable the white supremacists, the neo-Nazis, the hate groups that orchestrated the violence four years ago, finally in court. And uh, much like you, we were getting off the ground in 2017 when Charlottesville happened. IFA had been founded to hold accountable those who threaten the principles of our democracy, certainly a tall order. And when Charlotte's, the Charlottesville attack happened, it became clear that few things illustrated the threats to our democracy, the threats to our values, the threats to our communities more than, than the violence and the rise in extremism in this country. And as we now know, Charlottesville wasn't just an isolated incident, but really previewed the white supremacist violence, the extremist violence that's followed from Pittsburgh to Poway to El Paso, and certainly the Capitol attack just uh, seven months ago. And so uh, we very quickly sprang into action after the violence, uh, working with Charlottesville community members who are our plaintiffs and bringing a lawsuit against the two dozen individuals and hate groups that orchestrated the violence. What happened wasn't an accident, it was a planned intentional conspiracy to attack people based on their race, their religion, their willingness to defend the rights of others. It was motivated by racism, by anti-Semitism, by the white supremacy that we've seen rear its ugly head over and over again in recent years. And it was clear that the Department of Justice at the time was unlikely to act, to put it lightly. Um, and it required private citizens to take action. And that's who our brave plaintiffs are. Um, and it's been a long road, four years, but we are finally going to trial this fall in Charlottesville in federal court where we can hold accountable, bankrupt, and dismantle these groups and these leaders for their racist, violent conspiracy. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right that in some way it was a preview of what's to come. You know, I'm from Michigan. For me, what happened in Michigan in the spring of last year, as we were all in lockdown and the Proud Boys and Michigan militia and others, protested outside the Michigan State Capitol, not once, but twice, and once actually went in the Capitol, was a preview of what we later saw here at our, in our nation's Capitol on January 6th. And it was interesting in that, you know, Donald Trump's response at that time was quite similar to his response in Charlottesville. In fact, he, as you recall, he was calling on those protesters, not just in Michigan, but elsewhere, to liberate their states. Uh, and then in response to the Michigan protesters, he called them good people in the same way that he claimed were very fine people on both sides in Charlottesville. And as we think about accountability after Charlottesville, and it's, it's great to hear that IFA, uh, thanks to your leadership, is that you'll, you all will now be going to trial. Uh, you know, we think about accountability also after January 6th. And uh, if you could speak for a bit about 
kind of the ties between the perpetrators of the Charlottesville attack and those who we saw at the Capitol on January 6th, if there were direct ties, indirect ties, um, you know, interested in hearing your, I know you've done the research on this, uh, those links. Yeah, and I remember just in the aftermath of the Capitol attack, we joined with JDCA for a virtual program. And I think that many of us were still in shock that something like that could happen. But I don't think many of us were surprised I, because there's a through line that goes right from Charlottesville to the Capitol insurrection. And it was fueled by years of hate, years of disinformation, years of violence and white supremacy that went unchecked for so long. And so while I think many of us were horrified by what we saw on January 6th, very few of us were surprised because of that through line, the ways in which January 6th so clearly followed the Charlottesville playbook from the use of social media to plan the violence in meticulous detail. And obviously in the last few months, we've seen over 500 uh, prosecutions come out of DOJ that detail that planning in ways that Many of us only could have imagined when this all started unfolding. The use of supposed free speech instruments like flagpoles to violently attack people, whether it be peaceful counter protesters in Charlottesville or police officers at the Capitol. Um, the ideology that's at play, and I think it's really important to talk about this ideology. In Charlottesville, we heard Jews will not replace us. That wasn't an accident. That was a very specific reference to a white supremacist conspiracy theory called the Great Replacement that argues Jews are orchestrating the replacement of the white race through support for black and brown communities, immigrants, refugees. And over the last four years since Charlottesville, we've seen that conspiracy theory become increasingly mainstream on the right. Just a few days ago, Newt Gingrich was on Fox Business espousing this conspiracy theory. Tucker Carlson has given it a prime time home on Fox News. Um, and it's the same conspiracy theory that fueled not just the Pittsburgh attack, the Poe attack, the El Paso attack, but also really undergirded the ideology that we saw at the Capitol, this idea of the country being stolen. And that was backed up, sadly, by the anti-Semitic imagery we saw at the Capitol, the racist imagery and noose hanging outside the Capitol. And as we see that extremist ideology become increasingly mainstream, Republican officials, pundits, commentators are making it a part of the mainstream dialogue. We need to recognize it, we need to call it out, not just when it's used in the obvious horrific ways like in Charlottesville and these other white supremacist attacks, but when we see it in more subtle ways, like this idea of, a, of George Soros funding a caravan coming up from Central America, um, or of immigrants coming to the border to spread COVID and undermine uh, what they call American values, which is oftentimes a reference to uh, the, the white ethno state these extremists so crave. And so I really think it's important that we recognize how this ideology has become mainstreamed on the right and call it out, not just in the obvious ways, but in the more subtle ways, because it is one of the most dangerous threats right now and has fueled so much horror and violence. Yeah, and in the same way that those protests last year, which Donald Trump encouraged, uh, the Michigan State Capitol and elsewhere were protesting uh, COVID stay at home orders. I saw you actually, Amy, tweet this morning about uh, how there's a link between white supremacist replacement theory and the latest iteration, which is that immigrants are causing the COVID surge. Do you want to speak a little bit more about that and also how we've seen white supremacists uh, and right wing extremists uh, continue to perpetrate these, this disinformation that is not only threatening our communities, but, but our lives in the form of, uh, of COVID. Yeah, absolutely. And it's exactly right. It's, it's this idea that somehow immigrants are coming up through the southern border to, to fuel the COVID crisis. It's just the latest iteration of the replacement theory that has really been at the core of so many of these extremist attacks. And again, has become really increasingly mainstream among right-wing pundits and other officials. And so, of course, we all know, logically, it's not immigrants who are causing the COVID crisis. The COVID crisis is being exacerbated because there has been a slew of disinformation um, and, and other politicization of public health that has resulted in low vaccination rates in a number of communities that allow the Delta variant to mutate and has fueled this crisis. If people get vaccinated, we will not be facing the level of public health crisis that we are currently facing. Those of us who understand science 
know that to be true. However, in moments of crisis, there are always extremists who will seek to exploit that crisis. We saw it at the beginning of the pandemic when people used it to fuel anti-Asian hate, anti-Semitic hate, variety of other forms of extremism, trying to blame those communities for the pandemic, whether it be the you know, Donald Trump calling it the Chinese flu or the Wuhan flu, the horrific rise in anti-Asian hate, um, or conspiracies that said Jews or Israel are somehow behind the, the virus. And this latest manifestation that there are immigrants fueling the pandemic coming up through the southern border is the same idea, the same idea of extremists and particularly white supremacists trying to um, exploit a crisis to fuel their hate and their violence. And of course, it is increasingly mainstream when you have people like Newt Gingrich on Fox Business espousing it for the world to hear. Um, and it's when it becomes increasingly mainstream that it's especially dangerous because then that sends a signal to people that they can attack those communities, that they that the violence that has really come out of this um, ideology, been fueled by this ideology, is acceptable, not just by the fringe, but by mainstream leaders. You know, another iteration of, uh, of this ideology that we've seen kind of manifest itself in recent months since January 6th is uh, the use of another conspiracy theory, the big lie, to, uh, to fuel voter suppression efforts throughout the country. Uh, of course, we know that uh, Donald Trump lost this election, but we have seen uh, right-wing extremists peddle the notion, uh, the false notion of fraud, uh, largely as justification for these voter suppression laws that we've seen introduced in 48 states. There are over 400 of them. Uh, 30, I believe, have passed in 18 states. Do you see a direct link between those efforts and white supremacists, uh, those that, that IFA specifically is watching? Absolutely. All of these things are interconnected. And, and I think it's important to call, to call out the ways in which this sort of disinformation is central to violence, whether it be conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement or conspiracies like the Big Lie which of course have all fueled direct acts of violence from Charlottesville to the Capitol insurrection. Um, I, I also think it's important to say that it shouldn't be partisan to call this out. It's, it's crazy to me that we are having conversations that would suggest in any way, we, I mean the country, not us here right now, but that there are conversations that would suggest that calling out white supremacy, calling out violent extremism, calling out the fact that there are um, that the election results are what they are um, and that the big lie is in fact a big lie, that shouldn't be partisan. And the fact that it is, is, is probably the, the most horrific testament to the threats to our democracy. And I think, again, really illustrates the importance of accountability, of getting facts on the record, of not allowing extremists to rewrite history which is what they want to do. And we hear this not just you know, from the defendants in our lawsuit. They talk about how they don't want Charlottesville to be seen as another Selma. They want to rewrite the Charlottesville story so that what actually happened is no longer established for the history of books, but rather their version of it is out there. We saw something yeah. very similar on the Hill just a, what was exactly. that, two weeks ago, Amy, after January 6th, there certainly were, and unfortunately it is, it, it does appear that there's just a, a partisan split on this issue, but we saw many Republicans claiming that the January 6th insurrectionists were tourists. Exactly. Uh, and it's know, so that is a total rewrite of history and entirely inaccurate, and they know it. Exactly. And that's why it's so dangerous. And for us, the importance of this trial as it relates to Charlottesville is that it puts on the record, it makes crystal clear the facts of what happened, that it wasn't a clash between opposing sides. It wasn't an accident, that it was a deliberate racist conspiracy motivated by white supremacy, by anti-Semitism, by racism. Um, and putting that on the record, having a jury hear that testimony, issuing a verdict that makes clear that's not acceptable here. That's enormously powerful, not just for our plaintiffs, for the Charlottesville community, but also for our democracy, for making clear the consequences for this sort of hate and making an established record of what happened. And certainly with the whitewashing of January 6th and the many other ways there are those trying to undermine the reality that all of us know to be true, um, it's all the more important to have a trial like that 
and call out these extremists. Well, we have, we have a question. Uh, ben is asking, what can we as Jewish Dems do to push back against dangerous conspiracy theories like the Great Replacement Theory that contributed to Charlottesville, contributed to what we saw on January 6th and is such a threat to our community? There's so much that we can do. I think it's so easy to feel powerless and helpless in moments like this. I know I do. And I also think as Jews, it's really easy to draw parallels to the darkest times in our history and the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And I know it's impossible not to draw those parallels. But I also think there's a big difference. We are not powerless. We have a justice system. We have to fight like crazy to protect it, to make sure it works for everyone, which it certainly does not right now. But we can use it and we can use it to hold people accountable. So if you're interested in getting involved in, in actually holding those extremists accountable who threaten our democracy, who are promoting this conspiracy theory, who are part of the effort to make it an increasingly mainstream part of uh, this country, um, you can get involved through IFA or JDCA. At IFA, you can go to integrityfirstforamerica.org where you can read the lawsuit, you can sign up for case updates, you should follow us at integrity for usa on Instagram, um, if you so choose to support the case with a donation, know it directly supports the lawsuit itself and specifically security costs for our plaintiffs and our team. But it can't stop there. This is, I think, the greatest threat to our democracy right now, the rise in extremism and the rise in conspiracies and disinformation that allows this sort of violence and hate to go on unchecked. We need to keep checking it. We need to keep ensuring there's accountability. And that means not just nonprofits like us, like JDCA and others, but also making sure our officials on all levels of government are holding extremists to account, not just on the federal level, where, for example, the White House put out a plan a few months ago to begin to tackle this crisis, um, but also on the state and local levels, making sure hate crimes are prosecuted, making sure smart legislation in state houses is passed. We need to hold the private sector accountable, make sure social media companies are living up to their ethical obligations, um, and if not, move forward actions to help them get there. Um, and so there's a lot that we can do as citizens, as voters, as constituents, as consumers. Um, definitely encourage you all to get involved through IFA, through Integrity First for America, of course, through JDCA, which has been a fantastic partner in this work. Um, but we're not powerless, as daunting and as hard as this moment might seem. Absolutely. And uh, for, for those interested in getting involved in JDCA, jewishdoms.org, you can take action with us, including by encouraging members of Congress, uh, your representative and your senators to support legislation to combat extremism online, as well as uh, efforts to like the For the People Act to ensure that every vote is counted uh, and that our elections uh, work and are free and fair and not impeded by these voter suppression measures that we've seen pass in uh, 18 states. Um, you know, I, I want to end by just getting your reflections, uh, Amy, because it is such a big day, four years in Charlottesville. Uh, how do you, how do you, Think, where do you think we'll be at five years from Charlottesville? Uh, I assume by then the trial will have ended, I hope. I know it's been a long time coming. Uh, but do you think if, there, if there's actual accountability for the perpetrators of Charlottesville that we'll see actual progress in this effort to combat extremism and hate and, and uh, right-wing extremism in our country? Uh, where, where do you think we'll be a year from now? Well, we are scheduled for trial October 25th. And while in the COVID era, nothing is, is done until it's done, we feel quite confident that we are headed to trial this October, four years after we first filed suit. Um, and that means that hopefully we will have a jury verdict by Thanksgiving or so. Um, and so I hope that when we win that verdict at trial from a jury of Charlottesville and, and, and Virginia residents, it, of course, not only has the accountability, the justice that our plaintiffs at the Charlottesville community so needs and deserves four years after the fact, after so little accountability for the violence we saw four years ago, but it'll send a message, a message not just to the leaders of this movement who we're taking on in this case, who have already talked about its impacts. Richard Spencer has called it financially crippling and others have complained that it's hindered their ability to operate 
but it sends a deterrent message to anyone who's looking at participating in this sort of violent hate and makes clear the consequences. You will be sued, you will be held accountable, you will be bankrupted, you will be dismantled um, if you participate in this sort of violent hate. And there are those like us who will hold you accountable. Um, and so we are already seeing those impacts even before trial. When we win a verdict, it will have an infinitely larger impact. It's not a silver bullet. There's so much more that needs to be done as we talked about. But a case like this can both send that deterrent message to those considering getting involved and make sure the country is awake to this threat, to this crisis. Um, and I am, I am wholly confident that that is what will happen this fall. I'm in awe of our brave plaintiffs who survived the unthinkable four years ago and channeled it into this. Our incredible legal team who have been tireless in fighting for justice and accountability um, and making sure that we finally get to this trial and can win. Um, and really grateful to partners like you all and people watching who have been supportive of this effort and spreading the word and supporting it however you can. Um, it is not and it is not an effort that any one plaintiff or one organization can, can undertake alone. Um, and it's really been because of great coalitions of support, um, including all of you, that, that we've gotten to this point and that we expect to win a trial this fall. Well, let us hope. Let us hope that uh, at the five-year mark, hopefully uh, we will see a decline in, in extremism uh, in part also because we have a partner now, finally, after four long years in the White House. Uh, yep. It's also, as we recall, one of the reasons that Joe Biden ran for president was because of Charlottesville. Uh, so just as uh, Charlottesville uh, led to the founding of IFA and, uh, and JDCA, uh, it too uh, contributed to uh, the White House that we have today uh, and the effort to restore the soul of America, which is very much still underway. But at least we now have a dedicated president in the White House who shares our values uh, and is combating hate. Amen to that. So, great. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you for spending some time with us on, uh, on this solemn anniversary and day that is so meaningful and uh, may the trial go well. May you have a verdict soon. And uh, we're, we're just grateful for your efforts on the right side of history here to hold uh, right-wing extremists accountable for their actions. Thank we're you. We're so grateful for your partnership and thank you so much, everyone. Great, thanks. Bye.